You may be seated. And open your Bibles, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This passage that we'll be in today gives very straightforward, simple instructions to those who would have found themselves in the position of slaves in the city of Ephesus. No one, I can go out on a limb and say, no one in this room would find themselves in this position of a slave. And yet, here we find ourselves, 21st century, looking at 2,000 or so year old instructions. And these instructions are not only instructive to slaves in this context, but for us as well. By the time we get to chapter 6 in 1 Timothy, we are coming up on the end of a long section of this letter where Paul the Apostle has been systematically instructing Timothy how to shepherd various groups within the church. In chapter 5, he tells Timothy how to instruct or correct older men, younger men, older women, and younger women. He then enters into a lengthy set of instructions on widows, as well as elders at the end of chapter 5. And then our verses, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6, instructions written specifically to slaves. This group that we're going to look at this morning would have, socially speaking, been the lowest class of people in God's household. When it came to social status, they would have been at the bottom of the totem pole. These are people, these slaves, who have no independent claim to freedom or on their own lives. They don't possess a freed will. Their will is actually entirely submitted to the will of another, namely their masters. Now, the the mention of slavery in our context has a great potential of offending our American sensibilities What comes to mind when you think about slavery as an American is likely not the same as what is in the mind of the Apostle Paul and in the mind of Timothy as he is speaking. We'll talk about some of those similarities, but these systems, what took place in first century Rome as well as what took place here in America from the 16th or 1600s on is very different. Uh, The primary difference being that American slavery and the European slave trade included the unjust kidnapping of men and women, justified by the logic that those people were less human than their captors, simply because they were created with darker skin. It was race-based chattel slavery Uh, practiced in the Atlantic slave trade until the mid-1860s, this was actually unique. Even though slavery in the history of the world is not unique, the brand of slavery that was practiced in more recent history that we're more familiar with as Americans, this was unique because it found a biological reason that had not existed previously based on evolutionary theory that there were different races of people, and you could identify those people based on their skin pigmentation. And this was the, really the useful excuse or justified reasoning, logic, to enslave black people in America. Just to help draw 
and clarify the distinction that might be in your mind as we read this passage in a second. The difference between what we'll read about and what was actually practiced in the history of our nation, it's going to be helpful uh, just to hear from a man who once was a slave and who believed in Christ, to hear him articulate the differences between what he believed and what he saw practiced by people who also claimed Christ in his context. In the appendix of his autobiography, Frederick Douglass writes this, what I have said respecting and against religion, I mean strictly to apply to the slaveholding religion of this land and with no possible reference to Christianity proper. For between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. So wide that to receive the one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity. I look upon it as the climax of all misnomers, the boldest of all frauds, and the grossest of all libels. Never was there a clearer case of stealing the livery of the court of heaven to serve the devil in. I am filled with unutterable loathing when I con contemplate the religious pomp and show together with the horrible inconsistencies which everywhere surround me. We have men stealers for ministers, women whippers for missionaries, and cradle plunderers for church members. The man who wields the blood-clotted cowskin during the week, that's the whip, fills the pulpit on Sunday and claims to be a minister of the meek and lowly Jesus. The man who robs me of my earnings at the end of each week meets me as a class leader on Sunday morning to show me the way of life and the path of salvation. He who sells my sister for purposes of prostitution stands forth as the pious advocate of purity. He who proclaims it a religious duty to read the Bible denies me the right of learning to read the name of the God who made me. He who is the religious advocate of marriage robs whole millions of its sacred influence and, and leaves them to the ravages of wholesale pollution. The warm defender of the sacredness of the family relation is the saint that scatters whole families, thundering husbands and wives, parents and children, sisters and brothers, leaving the hut vacant and the hearth desolate. We see the thief preaching against theft and the adulterer against adultery. We have men sold to build churches, women sold to support the gospel, and babes sold to purchase the Bibles for the poor heathen, all for the glory of God and the good of souls. The slave auctioneer's bell and the church-going bell chime in with each other, and the bitter cries of the heartbroken slave are drowned in the religious shouts of his pious master. Revivals of religion and revivals in the slave trade go hand in hand together. The slave prison and the church stand near each other. The clanking of fetters and the rattling of chains in the prison and the pious psalm and solemn prayer in the church may be heard at the same time. The dealers in the bodies and souls of men erect their stand in the presence of the pulpit and they mutually help each other. The dealer gives his blood-stained gold to support the pulpit, and the pulpit, in return, covers his infernal business with the garb of Christianity. Here we have religion and robbery, the allies of each other, devils dressed in angels' robes, and hell presenting the semblance of paradise. That was the testimony of the church in this land at one point, or groups of people who call themselves the church. 
Suffice it to say, I think Paul would have something very different to say to those groups of individuals if he was writing to those. Nevertheless, this system in first century Rome that differed in so many ways from what we just read, it did share this in common. Both systems then and more recently included brutal, oftentimes unreasonably harsh men who oppressed people under their authority. And wherever you find sinners possessing authority, whether it be in the family, in the church, in the government, in the workplace, in schools, wherever sinners possess authority, you can expect some sort of abuse of that authority. First century Rome, the church in Ephesus, is no different. Turn your attention to verse 1 of chapter 6 in 1 Timothy as I read these first two verses. Paul says to Timothy, all who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake in the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. Teach and preach these principles. This was something that the Apostle Paul, when it came to slavery in Ephesus, and you can find these same instructions in other portions of your Bible in the New Testament, Paul expected these things to be taught, to be preached, to be proclaimed as morally binding on the slaves who believed in Christ, on those members of the church who found themselves in this station of life as slaves. Teach and preach these principles. Slavery was so common in the Roman world that roughly one-fifth of the population consisted of slaves. In larger cities, more populated areas like Ephesus, Corinth, and some other places, you could have up to about 33% of the population consisting entirely of slaves. And so in Ephesus, if the makeup of the city ref was reflected in the members of the church, then you would have had a considerable amount of slaves hearing these instructions. Now, with that thought in mind, this raises one question. If there was a sizable part of the congregation that was consistent, consisting of slaves, then why is there not more written? Did they really have more widows in the church than slaves? We see verses 3 all the way through verse 16 in chapter 5 committed entirely to widows. Tells you something of the importance of the church's reputation and what they do with widows and how widows are cared for in the character of older women who have lost their husbands. That's crucial. And so he commits plenty of instructions to them. In chapter 1, almost the entirety of the first chapter, really verses 3 on to the end, are committed to instructing Timothy what to do about false teachers. And so quite a bit of this letter is taken up with discussion about false teachers from chapter 1 to chapter 4, even on the heels of the instructions that we just read in chapter 6. People who are teaching error are constantly brought up in this letter. Church leaders, as we are so fond of looking at in chapter 3, you have instructions to elders in the beginning of the chapter and then deacons in the latter portion of chapter 3. And so those are sizable chunks of the letter committed to instructing certain groups so that Timothy would know what to do with certain groups. Why not slaves? Is it because they possess a lower status that Paul doesn't bother saying as much to them? 
No. We'll actually see it's quite the opposite why he instructs slaves. It's not because they're insignificant. They actually have a very significant part to play in what the church must do and be. The reason Paul only has to commit two verses to these instructions is because this is all slaves needed to know. It's because two verses was enough. The instructions that Paul gave to Timothy for shepherding slaves and what to do about their enslavement, this is what they needed to know. And so these instructions were sufficient. In these two verses, we encounter two sufficient instructions for believing slaves. That's what's here. Two sufficient instructions for believing slaves. The first of these instructions is number one, esteem your master if he is your master. Esteem your master if he's your master. This is simple, clear, and straightforward. All who are under the yoke as slaves, this is who the instruction is intended for coming through Timothy and then by proximity, the other elders and church leaders. All who are under the yoke as slaves. This means this is morally binding on every single individual who fits this description. Those under the yoke as slaves, that is, whose station in life is one to bear the burden of another, that's the the reference to the yoke to be used metaphorically here, those who found themselves doing work for someone else whose will was entirely captive to another individual, all of them, without exception, these instructions apply. Esteem your master if he is your master. The requirement of honor is what's being articulated here. They are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. There is a morally binding requirement to honor their master. One commentator says that what this means, he he defines this honor, this term well, He says they are to have an inner attitude of genuine respect for their masters, which finds outward expression in word, manner, and conduct. It's very simple. At the heart level, because you're a Christian who's called to sincerity, at the heart level, you must respect, have a genuine respect for the person in authority over you. And that genuine respect that takes place at the heart level manifests itself in outward obedience as it as it regards the words that you speak they reflect honor the way in which you carry yourself the the manner of your conduct the way you relate to them you carry out all of your duties all of your words all of your actions toward that individual who is your master with respect and honor. And so the respect goes with that title, master. It would have meant treating your master as if he is your master, treating the one who has legitimate authority over you as if he does have legitimate authority over you. Your will, your life would have been subject to this individual. Not only is there a requirement of honor, but to esteem your master if he is your master would include uh, or includes the recipient. And, And that's what we said, this is your own master. Not just every person who has the title master, but specifically your own. Your will is not subject to all slave owners, but specifically the one who has a rightful claim to your life. There's a requirement of honor, a recipient in mind. And Paul also has a consideration regarding honor. The consideration. Specifically, regard him or consider him, we could say, 
worthy. Consider him worthy. This means that he is due your honor. You owe it to him. Before God, you owe it to him, slave, Paul could have said. This is what the slaves in Ephesus were to consider. They were to take thoughtful inventory of this fact. When my master comes into mind, what I should think of is worthy. And obviously this would have been predicated not on his personality, but his position. Doesn't matter who he is because Paul doesn't include any details or any exceptions. There are no caveats or qualifications to this. Therefore, it's not based on the personality of the man, but it's merely based on his position. John Calvin, uh, in his commentary on this passage, helpfully says this, no man renders either to a prince or to a master what he owes to them unless looking at the eminence to which God has raised them. He honors them because he is subject to them. For however unworthy of it they may often be, Still, that very authority which God bestows on them always entitles them to honor. Besides, no one willingly renders service or obedience to his master unless he is convinced that he is bound to do so. Parents, you get this? Your children are not bound to only show you honor when you're worthy of it. Praise God. When you are conducting yourself in a manner less than honorable, before God, your child is still required to show honor. And that is the whole cause, if we're biblical in our parenting, that we should be putting before our children. Don't fear dad because dad is fearsome. Don't fear dad because you fear dad ultimately. Even that would be a display of idolatry. Because I ultimately fear dad, I'm going to obey him or mom because of what they could do to me. Maybe you've said that or heard that said. That's not the, a good reason to obey parents for children. Children like slaves ought to obey the one in authority over them simply because they are worthy of all honor, simply because of the title, simply because of, of the position. And in addition, regarding this honor, we see a requirement for it, the recipients of it, the consideration for it. There's also an amount of honor to be considered. Do you see what Paul says in verse 1? How much honor are they to show? All honor. All of it. That means when it comes to your master, don't withhold any honor that you should show. Any honor that you could show should be shown for the title that he holds. No amount of honor could be lacking in the slave's attitude toward his master. He was the subservient employee of this individual, and so all honor that he could leverage, all honor he could muster in his strength was owed to that man, not because the man was worthy, intrinsically, but because God said that this is how he should consider him. Because of the, the similarity uh, between what we're reading about here, a slave and his master, as well as the employee-employer relationship, obviously there's a, a unique difference in what was happening in first century Rome because that master had sole claim to his authority or his slave's work. No one else could come and take of that slave's time or energy or resources for himself without the master's permission. If you're an employee, you don't, we don't fit that description. You can work multiple jobs, you can work for a company and work for yourself at the same time, you can get paid, uh, for a completely different skill set than what you go to work with nine to five and, and do for another employer. So obviously there's that difference. But it is 
helpful to consider when you are on the clock. Your employer does own your time. Your will is subservient to an employer. You don't have a right to do as you will while someone's paying you to do not as you will, to do as they will. And so it's worth asking with that in mind, does your employer, Christian, get the sense that you, the Christian employee, regard him or her as worthy of all honor? When you go to work, does your boss, your manager, get the impression that you're treating him in a way, not in keeping with his personality, but in keeping with his position? And all of that for the sake of Christ. That is what our employers should think of us. When we labor, they should get the impression that we are not laboring ultimately for their sake. And that the way we treat them, worthy of all honor, that doesn't come from the impressiveness, from the weightiness, from the person who directly oversees the Christian employee. They might not be able to explain it, but they should get the sense that there's a difference between the way they're treated by the Christian and by others who don't know Christ. That would be a phenomenal testimony if every member of Grace Bible Church, the managers in the valley, thought, man, they go to that church too? They're treated, they treat their employees worthy of all honor? That would go a long way for hiring other people in Grace Bible Church. If each employee treated their boss worthy of all honor, a supernatural ability to respect the one who has oversight over us, that would be a phenomenal testimony coming from this church. The motivation that is given here is at the end of verse 1, what is the motivation for honor? Is it that you could lose your life if you're a slave in Ephesus? Well, that could be true, but that's not the motivation. Is it that you might never gain your freedom? And if you just obey long enough as a faithful slave, sometime at the end of your life, you might be set free. And then your children to follow would have freedom to walk in and you'd have a legacy in your family of freedom. No. As sweet as that might be, that is not the way Paul seeks to motivate slave with those kinds of carnal enticements, carnal benefits. Any slave could be motivated by those things. The motivation that Paul gives to slaves are unique as the household to which they belonged. He says at the end of verse 1, to regard your, their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that, purpose clause, the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. That's it. That's the motivation for obeying, for all sl Christian slaves obeying their master. Whether Christian or not, that's the motivation. God's name, as well as God's word, must be esteemed so that they wouldn't be dishonored. That's it. Is, is that motivation enough for you to honor your employer? And, and in all other areas of life, is that motivation enough for us to obey God? God's name and God's word are on the line. Not the nature of them. They are unchanging. God's unchanging. The nature of his word is unchanging. God's always been God. He'll always be God, even if nobody believed that. And when all the nations gathered together to uh, shake their fist at God in Genesis 11, he was not bothered in the least. He didn't change. That's not at stake. But the representation of who God is certainly is. He can be misrepresented by us. He could be misrepresented by slaves. And so, so that 
God's name and what Paul calls our doctrine. The, the word there is just teaching. What we teach, which is God's word, will not be spoken against. You must do this. Think about the way the slave's conduct would have upheld God's name in Ephesus. A slave doing something that was utterworldly and completely uncommon would have upheld God's name. A slave who was rebellious before the gospel came to Ephesus, for that master to see an instantaneous change overnight, a disrespectful, belligerent slave submits to Christ and receives these instructions from the shepherds, Timothy and the other elders, and they are taught how to regard their masters. With his life, that slave would have been saying something that no unbelieving slave could have said, particularly about God's character. That slave, that believing slave, in treating their master worthy of all honor, would have said with his life that God is in control. God has chosen enslavement for me in this life, and so I can trust him. That slave would have said with his life, before he even uttered a word, he would have been saying by his deeds that God is sovereign. He would have also been saying that God is wise. God is wiser than me, the slave. Would the slave have chosen to be a slave? Probably not. And yet by entrusting himself to God, he would have been saying with his life that God knows better than me. God can plan my life better than I can. And so... I can trust him. God has even chosen sovereignly the particular master to which I am enslaved. I can trust him. God is wise. God is sovereign. And he also would have been saying that God is good. Whatever God has wisely and sovereignly chosen for me is better than anything that I would choose for myself. It's actually better because God is good to a degree that I am not. I can trust him. All of those things could have just been embodied in a slave's actions of considering his master worthy of all honor. This is what Paul is after. So that God's name will not be spoken against. God's glory would be put on display by Christian slaves embracing this mentality. And not only God's name being upheld, but also his truth. His doctrine, his teaching what comes from his word. Paul here binds Christian slaves with the responsibility of upholding God's name and God's truth in the world. This is not the first time that he has laid this burden on this group, though, because he said something very similar In chapter 3, verse 15, we read this in Equipping Hour this morning. Slaves are not the only people who bear this burden to uphold God's name and God's truth in the world. Look at verse 14 in, in 1 Timothy 3. I am writing these things to you, Timothy, Paul says, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Paul's writing to Timothy specifically for the same purpose that slaves have to consider their masters worthy of all honor. Because the church is the household of the living God. Therefore, people have to know how to conduct themselves. Widows have to know how to conduct themselves. Teachers have to know how to conduct themselves. Men have to know how to conduct themselves. And women have to know how to conduct themselves. All because the church is the church of the living God, the household, the family, if you will, of the living God. And so what the world thinks about God is predicated on what the church does, how the conduct of the people within the church manifests in life. 
when these instructions came to Ephesus, as the Ephesian church was being instructed in these ways, the slave had a unique opportunity in regarding their masters as worthy of all honor to say something truthful about God's word. They would have been saying that God's word is authoritative. They would have been saying that God's word, like God, is good. So these instructions, even though they may not be my preference naturally, they are worthy of obeying. They're worth obeying. I'm compelled to obey them because I'm not the Lord of my own life. Jesus is Lord. So Jesus gets to tell me what to do. When Jesus tells me as a slave what to do through his apostle Paul, I say, yes, Lord, amen, and I obey, and I consider my master worthy of all honor. The slave would have been communicating uh, something as unusual as a confidence in the eternal nature of God's word. These, na- these instructions transcend time. They transcend people. It's not based on the person. It's not based on the timing that this is given. It's not based on my situation, temporally speaking. These words transcend this life. And so they're morally binding on me. The slave, even if he was instructed well enough, would have known I'm not living for this life. Sure, I might be a slave for a hundred years, maybe. And in an unfortunate position as a slave under a brutal master. And that slave in that difficult, trying circumstance could have said, maybe I'll never get out of this situation, but I'm not living for this life. There's a coming kingdom and I'm living for that one. And it'll be a brief period of time before my time in the kingdom under the better rule and reign of King Jesus will surpass the 100 years that I've been here. I can endure this. They would have been communicating that they're living for a different time, a different age, a different world to come. Now, when Paul says here at the end of verse one, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against, Spoken against, literally blasphemed. What is that? What does it mean for the word of God to be blasphemed or spoken against? Can you imagine when the letter arrived from Paul to Timothy? Timothy gets that letter. It's to him personally, but certainly meant for the good of the entire church. That's why it's included here. The church is still reading Paul's personal letter to Timothy. When the church in Ephesus would have heard Paul's words to Timothy and the believing slaves went away from the gathering that Sunday back to their unbelieving masters and other unbelieving slaves talking about these instructions, we got we to gotta do a better job of considering our master worthy of all honor. Even though he's not an honorable individual, we have a duty before God to treat him, to consider him with great respect, all respect and honor. What would the unbelieving slaves hearing, overhearing those conversations had thought? Would they think, wow, that's so wise. You're right. Not a chance. Not a chance. And even if they did agree that the master should be treated worthy of all honor, they certainly couldn't be, uh, wouldn't be on board with the reason given, the motivation, so that God's name and God's doctrine would be upheld, wouldn't be spoken against. They wouldn't agree with that. These are otherworldly instructions. And so the speaking against can't mean don't let the unbeliever think this is foolish. The unbeliever is going to think that God's instructions are foolish. The same man who wrote these instructions, don't let the word of God be spoken against, also wrote that the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So Paul's hope wasn't in maybe they'll see the wisdom of these as unbelievers and still get on board. That's not the idea. 
The point is, don't give any occasion for the word of God to be blasphemed. Should unbelievers speak against God's truth, don't let it be your fault. Don't let there be hypocrisy or a discrepancy between what God actually says and the way you conduct yourself. To speak against God's word would be for a slave to conduct himself in a way that made God seem like every other God. To make God's instruction seem like the instruction that was carried out or given by other religious leaders of the day who worshiped idols, who served idols. Don't give them any occasion for that to be said. The God who is the God of the church is the living God. Prove it by your life. That's the idea. So esteem your master if he is your master is the simple instruction here. And you see how much is riding, how much is at stake, how much is riding on the slaves obeying these instructions. And the second sufficient instruction for believing slaves is equally simple. It is this, serve your master if he is your brother. Serve your master if he's your master. Esteem your master if he's your master. Serve your master if he's your brother. These are the two instructions, and these are sufficient. Verse 2 says, those who have believers as their masters, obviously there's a category that Paul has in his mind for Christians, faithful members of the church who can also own slaves in this context. Very different than what we read from Frederick Douglass narrative. So there is a category here in this system for believing slave masters. But the instructions aren't very different, are they? Serve your masters. They must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren. No. Instead, they must serve them all the more, specifically because they're brethren. They're, those who partake in the benefit are beloved, or believers rather, and beloved. So here, Paul has a different group in mind who are the recipients of this service. When he says, those who have believing masters, that's specifically those slaves of brethren in the faith. Uh, and he calls them by several names. Those who have believers in verse 2. He calls them these masters brethren. He calls them beneficiaries because they partake of the benefit. And he calls them believers again, but then beloved. These people who are being served are believers. They're brothers, they're beneficiaries, and beloved. They're brothers because they're members of the same household. As we saw in chapter 3, the household of God is the church. So if you had slaves and slave masters in the church, then as members of the church, they possessed a different relationship. There was a, a different nuance given to their relationship, not slave master in the church anymore, but brother, brother. It's even interesting to note that these uh, instructions come on the heels of instructions to elders in verses 17 to 25 in chapter 5. What would you do in Ephesus if you had a slave who was incredibly godly and became an elder? Perhaps a deacon, some leader in the church who also had to obey these instructions about slaves what to do with their masters. Well, in the church, I'm your leader, but as your slave, I'm submissive. It would have made for an interesting relationship and even an otherworldly response from both parties, master and slave. Yeah, he's my elder, I submit to him. He's my deacon, I submit to him when it comes to matters of the church, and he submits to me when it comes to matters of whatever the duty is as a slave. And we get along great and we love each other. You would never have found that anywhere outside of the church. He's my brother. That's unique. That's unique. 
There's a prohibition of service as well, a prohibition that Paul gives. Do not be disrespectful. Don't withhold honor. Don't withhold respect from them simply because they're brethren. This actually needed to be said to slaves because of the new relationship that existed between believing slaves and masters. Okay, y'all are brothers now, but here's what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean you're disrespectful to them now. Siblings don't typically have authority over each other. Really good thing. (laughs) It's not pretty when uh, they assume they do. So this has to be said to believing slaves with believing masters. Hey, just because you've experienced this leveling effect of the gospel on your relationship, now there's not this hierarchy, but your family now, your brethren, you you have the same father who is God by adoption, but that's not an occasion to disrespect them now. This does prove, though, uh, in this rationale that Paul has to give because they're brethren, it does highlight the leveling influence of the cross, of the gospel. What does the gospel do to those who are typically self-sufficient, socially speaking? Well, it humbles them. It brings them down a notch, right? People who uh, are perhaps strong, have a noble name, who are intelligent and wise in a worldly sense, God's grace comes to them in the message of the gospel and says to those sinners, no, you're unworthy, you're weak, you're helpless, you're ungodly, you have no merit to offer and no remedy for your plight. All of your resources do nothing for you when it comes to salvation. And so these naturally self-sufficient people, rich, intelligent, strong, talented, and yes, masters with authority over slaves, the cross humbles them. They get humbled. And the same message comes to a different class of sinners and brings exaltation and estimable blessings to them. People who... uh, are beyond the world's cares. It comes to them, the poor of the world, the disesteemed. It gives them a kingdom. It brings to them eternal life, hope beyond this world. It gives them a personal, intimate, true knowledge of God, eyes that see the world rightly, wisdom that transcends the best philosophers of the day to discern truly the human heart as it is, strength to endure the worst hardships, and all of that as we've been uh, learning from what Smith's teaching in Equipping Hour, eternal rewards that transcend this life. And so in doing that for the lowly, it exalts them, everybody's level. This, by the same message. But in serving the masters who are also brethren, Paul obligates them to, to serve. And he obligates them even all the more. All the more. This is a much more service. The thought for the slave can't be, he's just my brother. I'm not serving him. Uh, my boss is a Christian. He'll be gracious. He's got to forgive me. <laughs> if I show up late, he's a, he's a merciful guy. God's made him merciful. So I'm going to bank on that and take my time getting in to work today. That can't be the attitude of the Christian. It's an all the more, uh, the same all the more that's used in Romans 5. If he saved us, By his death, much more shall we be saved by his life. That's the same much more word used here. You mean he's a Christian? You're enslaved to a Christian? You're employed by a believer? You have to work even harder for him. Why? Because the one who is benefiting from your labors, they're believers. And beloved. 
the same grace you experienced to believe the gospel, they've experienced the same grace. You got to go to work for them. The same undeserved privilege that you experienced, so have they. Work hard. And they're beloved. The, all of the love of God, we're often encouraged to, to consider the marvelous, incomprehensible love of God. Well, consider those same truths about your brother. How often do you consider the depths of God's love for other individuals in the body? That's what's in view here. They are beloved. God, do you know how much God loves your master? Serve them is the idea. And so this obligation for their service, it must be practiced submissively and fervently. And even the motivation is not self-interested, but it's because they are believers, because they are beloved. Just to highlight a couple implications as we close our time. It is astonishing the way that this passage, passage is instructing all the church. Sure, these are particular instructions for slaves, but this is certainly beneficial for all the church. And, and primarily, I have in mind a couple ways. This passage proves two things, that every doctrine counts. Every single biblical doctrine matters for your life. Every doctrine counts and every member matters. Let me explain what I mean. Think about all of the various doctrines as, as we would categorize them sort of today that come to bear on this passage, on slaves receiving these instructions, how many doctrines sort of intersect with these brief instructions? Well, for, for starters, theology proper, a high view of God himself, theology proper matters. Just think of the way that Paul is motivating the slaves. Uh, God's name, God's reputation, and God's doctrine, God's word, are on the line and how you conduct yourself. If these slaves had no regard for the glory of God, if they had a low view of God, then it would not have mattered to them that God's name and truth were on the line in their conduct. A low view of God, a poor theology proper, would have resulted in these instructions falling on deaf ears. We have to have a high view of God if we're going to obey him well. If they didn't believe God was sovereign, if they didn't understand God's wisdom, if they didn't embrace God's goodness or his authority as articulated in the scriptures, then these instructions would have lost their potency. So theology proper is crucial to receiving instructions like this. Even bibliology, a high view of scripture, your bibliology matters. If they would have said what some people in our day who call themselves Christians say, well, you know, the Bible isn't perfect. Some things are come from man and some things come from God. You know what slaves would have done with these instructions? Well, that's the part that's from man. Who is Paul? I'm looking for Jesus' words, right? No. To believe that all of Scripture is inspired by God, to believe that all of Scripture is morally binding, to believe in the clarity of Scripture, it's clear. You can't pass off these instructions as if you don't understand them. No, they're very clear. Paul is speaking clearly. God is speaking clearly through Paul. So obey. Your bibliology matters. Your soteriology, that is a study of salvation, and the gospel, that matters. As we said, it has this humbling influence on those who believe. Your ecclesiology matters, what you think about the church. Uh, ecclesia being that Greek word for church. Your ecclesiology matters. It matters that for, for in, in Ephesus, 
Slaves are a part of the congregation. Masters are a part of the congregation. What do we do with that? Well, here's what we do with that. Paul tells us we treat each other like brethren. Not only does every doctrine count, and you could add to the, the list, but every member matters. Every member matters. The Apostle Paul, who maybe not to the world would have been a big deal, but certainly to the church, the Apostle Paul would have been a big deal. To think of the Apostle Paul, to take the time, any time, to treat this lowly group of individuals who are members of the church as so crucial to carrying out the church's mission is astounding. It's not like, yeah, they're just slaves, whatever. We can get on to more important groups in the church. No, he actually thinks the group in the church that is most despised in the world's eyes matters a great deal. So if the slaves in Ephesus matter, then every, every member matters. And that informs us on how we should think of our role in the church. Do you think, ah, uh, somebody else can take care of that need? Ah, uh, somebody else will do it. That counseling situation, ah, uh, let somebody else do it. No, every member matters. The, the couple that's struggling in their marriage, the parents struggling in their parenting, the individual uh, who's struggling with some counseling need, anxiety, discontentment, whatever it may be, they're needed. <laughs> the, the sanctification in their life, the, their godliness is needed so that God's name is upheld in the world, so that God's truth is rightly upheld in the world. Every member matters. And so you see a need, you see a, an issue, step into it. If you're not equipped to step into that need, don't alert the pastor, hey, let me let you know what's going on, and go, go get him. <laughs> Say, would you help equip me to step into this, this need? I remember years and years ago when Scott was preaching through Acts, we got to Acts 6, the passage about those uh, prototype deacons. And there was a really clear call that, hey, we need more godly men who can step up and meet that need. So I emailed the elders. I'm probably not the guy to fill this need. <laughs> but help me get equipped. It's a good mindset to have as you see needs, having eyes to, to see those needs as well as a heart to meet them. Um, and even, again, as we, as we think about church planting, every single member matters. What enables us to plant churches faster? Well, a robust membership, not just in number, but in godliness. We need men who can step up and meet ministry needs, who can lead small groups, who can uh, fill the position of a deacon so that the elders can commit themselves further to the ministry of the word and prayer. Those are needs. Those are legitimate needs. We need older women who are training up a generation of younger women. We need parents who are excelling in their parenting of young children to be models for other parents and to be instructors of those same parents. Those are legitimate needs. Every doctrine counts. Every single member matters, even at Grace Bible Church. God, thank you for these instructions that we would have never thought to write ourselves. We would have never articulated these truths, these ways. These instructions are beyond us. The wisdom that you communicated in them are far beyond our pay grade, and we are so thankful to just sit under your word and consider these things again. God, would you use the consistent but meager efforts of the leaders here, of the various members, 
here of the ongoing ministries to strengthen this church body, not for our glory, not for our sake, not unto us, not unto us, but to your name be the glory. Would you use us to, hum to, to humbly exalt uh, your name and your wor word in the world? We know that's what you love to do, and you use unworthy people to do it, and so we pray that we would just be privileged to be used however you see fit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.